Yuri, Mrs. Wiggins, we going in deep, y'all. Art, 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 art 101 with Mr. Burger. <laughs> Hello friends and welcome back to another episode of Art 101 with me, Mr. Berger. I'm a professional artist and educator attempting to bring you the absolute best in art historical videos and content. Who, who the f*** do you think you are, you crazy little shit? As always, I appreciate the likes, shares, new subscribers, old subscribers. Uh, you know, I'm not picky. I like it all. <laughs> In this episode, we're going to look at the building blocks that create all artworks. We call these the principles of design. Man, like when they come over to clean that pool, man, start going all... Now, generally, when art teachers start talking about the principles of design, they're talking about pattern, contrast, emphasis, balance, proportion, scale, harmony, rhythm, and movement. But I kind of, I approach it a little different. You better start talking, asshole. Because we got shit we need to talk about. When I start to give instruction on the principles of design, I start to focus on five basic things. Those are focal point, balance, space, contrast, and rhythm. Now I know somebody's going to disagree with me and say that I'm being uh, completely uh, irrational. But make your own dang video. Mine focuses on five. You're the blind one! Now let me give you a quick overview by looking at the five principles through the artwork of Charles de Muth. In 1928, American artist Charles de Muth set out to make a portrait of his friend, the famed poet Roman Carlos Williams. De Muth visualized the line from the poem that Williams wrote when he saw a fire engine racing through the streets. I saw the figure five in gold. To Demuth, that was a vivid line of poetry that seemed to symbolize the poet himself. This line proved to be a compelling subject for an artwork, and Demuth would name the painting after that line, the figure five in gold. Now to the original point, artists design their works in order to communicate a message or vision. The process of creation involves choosing between and among methods of arrangement in order to arrive at the final design that will best say what the artist has in mind. In creating this work, Demuth arranged a large five to unify the composition. Although the work is not symmetrical, it very much seems balanced. One side is not heavier than the other. The other inspirations in the work, such as Bill at the top for William Carlos Williams, are subordinated to the central figure five. Perfect. We couldn't have planned this better. The diagonal in the work suggests the slanting raindrops, establishing a strong diagonal force, and using the color red, presumably the color of the fire engine, contrasts with the gray background of the great rainy city night. Don't you think I realize what's going on here? The five is repeated in ways that suggest the approach and passage of the truck as we see in the various scales of sides. Now in previous videos I've looked at the elements of art. We need to examine how we can use these elements to create the building of actual artwork. Ah, thanks. I needed that. In two-dimensional works like paintings, drawings, photography, and so forth, this organization is called composition. But in a broader term that applies to an entire range of visual arts, we would call this design. The word design indicates both process of organizing visual elements and the product of the process. As he created the figure five in gold, Demuth masterfully uses the principles of design that we will consider in this video. Focal point, balance, space, contrast, and rhythm. Of course I remember. Let us start with the focal point. An artist's goal is typically to draw your attention into the artwork. 
This is often called emphasis. If the area is a specific spot or figure, it is called a focal point. Position, contrast, color intensity, and size can all be used to create an emphasis or focal point. Through subordination, an artist creates natural areas of lesser interest to keep us from being distracted by other areas of focus. Nicholas Poussin's The Holy Family on the Steps has the most important figures in the center, the strongest location of any visual field. However, in Edgar Degas' Jockeys Before the Race, a completely different approach is taken. The artist uses size, shape, placement, and color to create areas of emphasis away from the center. The sun is a separate focal point created through contrast and placement. The sky and grass areas, however, are muted in color with almost no detail at all, so they will be subordinate to and thus support the areas of emphasis. Generally, using the focal point and the areas of subordination, the artist is showing us where to look in the artwork. Oh yeah? Watch this. Now let's take a look at balance. Sculptors such as Alberto Giacometti, balance is both a visual issue and a structural necessity. The dynamic process of seeking balance is equally basic in all art. Balance is the achievement of equilibrium in which acting influences are held in check by opposing forces. We strive for balance in life and in our art. Our instinct for physical balance finds its parallel in a desire for visual balance. What's that? The two most general types of balance are symmetrical and asymmetrical. That remains to be seen. Symmetrical balance is near or exact matching of the left and right sides of a three-dimensional form or a two-dimensional composition. Works like these have symmetry. We can see this symmetry in Giacometti's work Petite. Although there are some slight differences from the left and the right, it is a very balanced work and thus a symmetrical balance. This is such a delight! Now in my mind, there is no better way to look at symmetrical balance than to go back to a topic that I've talked about before with Federalist architecture. Architects often employ the symmetrical balance in order to give unity and formal grandeur to a building facade, better known as the front side. In 1792, James Hoban won a competition for his design of a president's house, a symmetrical drawing creating a mansion in a Georgian, Federalist, or later to be known as Jeffersonian style. Today, two centuries and several editions later, we now know this structure as the White House. You know, we just set another stock rocket. You, you saw that, right? Symmetrical design is useful in architecture because it is easier to comprehend as opposed to asymmetrical design. These compositions are equally balanced among large and complex buildings as we try to comprehend them at a glance. We generally want our symbolically important buildings to have a motionless and stable design. All of the qualities that make symmetry desirable to an architect make it generally less desirable in sculpture and two-dimensional art. Too much symmetry can be boring. Although artists admire symmetry for its formal qualities, they rarely use it rigidly. Artists generally do not want their work to seem static or still. So therefore, asymmetrical balance is the right and left sides not being the same. Instead, various elements are balanced according to their size and are arranged according to a feeling or implied center of gravity. For example, Portrait of Picasso by Salvador Dali has a composition where the whole seems very balanced, but only because of dramatic imbalances that are held in check. Why don't you take a picture? It'll last longer. On the left side, we see the bust of a horned Picasso melting over a pedestal. All of the details of the painting, by and large, are on the left-hand side of the canvas. The only major element that projects into the right side of the canvas is the silver spoon that is coming from his mouth. As with the design itself, there are no rules, only principles. 
The truth is, most artists rely on a highly developed sense of what looks good or bad to achieve this dynamic balance. Simply put, a work of art is balanced when it feels balanced. They considered, no, they didn't consider using it. They've used it. Now let's take a look at space. Space or depth is a perception of distance from the front to back or near to far within the artwork. Early on, beginning art students work to understand and apply perspective to create the illusion of depth and a two-dimensional illusion of space. Let's take a quick look at three basic zones of depth. Flat space, shallow space, and deep space. A composition with flat space appears to be all on one picture plane. Ambiguous figure ground relationships create a space where all parts of the work are on the surface of the work and thus appear flat. Bueller. 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 Shapes appear to be side by side. Sometimes called decorative space, this space is found most typically in a print or decorative media, such as screen printing works that are found in fashion. However, it tends to work very well also with non-objective designs, such as Pete Mondrian's Grey Tree. Shapes that represent objects can be used, but they stay fairly flat. As soon as an image starts to look a little bit three-dimensional or shapes that start to stack up on top of one another, the illusion of space begins to be created. If the spatial illusion is minimal or controlled to not open up very much depth, then shallow space is created. There are two ways of creating the illusion of a shallow space, by overlapping and by shading. Look, Ma! I'm roadkill! Overlapping is where objects appear to be on top of one another. If overlapping is used alone with flat shapes, like in a figure ground relationship, the space will remain fairly flat. When items appear to be rounded or have shading, the illusion of depth is created. The layering of elements by Norman Rockwell in his triple self-portrait allows us as the viewer to understand that the artist is looking into a mirror to create a self-portrait. This illusion of space is generated through overlapping. Uh, huh, I knew it. Shading is a way to make objects appear three-dimensional on a two-dimensional surface. Different values created when light hits a three-dimensional object cause the object to appear as occupying space. In The Veteran in a New Field, Winslow Homer creates the illusion of space through light and dark areas that help create the illusion of a realistic space on a two-dimensional surface. Overlapping can give priority what is nearest and furthest, but cannot tell how much space exactly is involved. Shading can make an object look three-dimensional, but that limits them to occupying shallow space. It takes perspective to give the illusion of deep space. In deep space, there are three terms that are used to describe the depth. The foreground, the middle ground, and the background. The foreground basically means the front, or the area immediately in front of the observer. The middle ground is in the middle. There's no specific measurement for the limits of this. It's just kind of in the middle. And the background is in the distance. The term means behind or in back of something. In the landscape, it means far away. There's a great deal of latitude as to how much space each of these areas occupies. A great example that really has all three zones in it is Haystacks by Claude Monet. This Impressionist representation of reality has the primary stack in the foreground, the trees in the middle ground, and additional haystacks and trees in the background. Now there are situations where one of these is missing. In a controlled space, such as a room, there may be no background. In some instances, there may be no foreground visible. A foreground object in front of a distant object may eliminate the middle ground. Here's a painting by Grant Wood called The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. There is a background and a middle ground, but there is no foreground. 
As an artist, it is important to control how much depth there is in the image. From flat to shallow to deep space, it is necessary to know perspective so you can successfully create the illusion of depth within your works. We're working really hard. You're not working hard enough. I need results. Perspective in art is a technique that is used to represent three-dimensional objects in a two-dimensional surface. This representation should look natural and realistic. Now there are two basic systems of perspective, linear and atmospheric. You could say that. Linear perspective is the perspective that most are familiar with. It was formalized during the Renaissance and is based on the concept that objects appear smaller as they get further away from the observer. In the School of Athens by Raphael Sanzio, we see the one-point linear perspective that is used to create the illusion of space. If Dr. Strangeport can't restore power to the control panel, we'll be marooned in space forever. Oh no! Atmospheric perspective, or aerial perspective, is based on the understanding of how the air acts as a filter to change the appearance of objects in the distance. The example of Brooklyn Bridge in winter shows the city through a winter snow. Objects that are closer to the viewer seem darker, more detailed, and lower on the canvas. All of these elements are consistent with atmospheric perspective. Am I the only one around here who gives a shit about the role? Now let's look at the light and dark areas better known as contrast. Where are the darkest elements? Where are the lightest elements? Uh, why are you asking me this? It's just, I, I, don't, I don't write the questions. This use of light and dark areas pull the focus of the viewer. And it's just as simple as that. Good answer. Good answer. And what do I know? I color for a living, but I think if you're going to get involved with any form of art, regardless of what it is, you've got to know something about rhythm. Rhythm is the repetition and movement in which some elements are regularly repeated within the work. It's just like music, dance, and poetry. These rhythms can be loud, soft, fast, or slow. Good composition, regardless of the form of art, have a variety of rhythms with a variety of elements. Strong rhythm dominates Jose Clemente Orozco's Zapatistas, the line of similar diagonally placed figures grouped in a rhythmic sequence expresses the determination of oppressed people in revolt. But remember, a fin de need is a fin de need. The strong diagonals of the hat brims, bayonets, and swords all contribute to the feeling of the action. In fact, the diagonal lines really dominate the entire composition. These repetitions of diagonal lines as well as the consistent color palette give the artwork a great deal of rhythm. Along with rhythm, unity and variety are components that can add interest into an artwork. Unity is the appearance of all elements that are working together to make up a coherent and harmonious whole. Variety counters unity by adding more interest into the work. Uncontrolled variety can be chaos, but too little variety is boring, so it is definitely a balance that needs to be taken within an artwork. In this painting, Going Home by Jacob Lawrence, he creates a balance between unity and variety as he adds rhythm throughout the entire work. His use of line, shape, and colors, and elements like the train seats and figures and luggage that are repeated over and over creates a repetition within the theme. My goodness, what are the odds of this? Notice the varied repetitions in the green chairs and window shades. As a unifying element, the same red is used in a variety of shapes, and the many figures and objects in the complex composition form a unified design throughout the artist's skillful use of abstraction, theme, and variation. All right, my opinion is, is, is wrong and stupid. Listen to whatever you want. Now consider this, my friends. 
The finished artwork affects us because the principles of art are being organized throughout the design in a way that captivates our attention. As an artist looks onto a blank piece of paper, an empty canvas, a lump of clay, or a simple block of marble, the artist begins a process involving many decisions, false starts, and changes in order to achieve the finished product. We have looked at the principles of design that guide the creation of these artworks. As we move forward as artists and appreciators of art, hopefully we will keep these very important principles in the backs of our minds so we can better understand the types of artwork that we like to make and we can better understand the pieces of work that we most appreciate. This is blowing my mind! Now that was a marathon of a video but man, do I love that story. Dick. That was so creepy. Ugh. Why are you smiling? I thought he was cute. Oh, that's disgusting. You thought he was cute? <laughs>